Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's the, here's the introduction. Um, welcome everyone to our Benjamin Moore CEU. Uh, silver sponsor, Benjamin Moore. Thank you so much. Today's topic is why pigments matter. So my name is Terry Fury. I'm New Jersey chapter president. I think we need to uh, mute it. <laughs> Christina, a little bit until, thank you. All right, so my name is Terry Fiore. I'm your New Jersey chapter president, and I'm joined by our program com committee members, Martha Drago, Elena Spina, and our director, Nada Elzubi. I'm not sure if Judy Crook is on the call. She's also a member as well. Um, so what we're going to do is we're gonna mute everyone, um, and you can enter your questions into the chat. And um, I'd like to introduce to you industry partner, most of you already know, Diana Ritazzi, who is the architectural and design representative covering New Jersey for Benjamin Moore Paints. She's been with Benjamin Moore for 29 years, educating- 30 our now. Oh my gosh, 30 I hit 30. <laughs> wow, awesome. <laughs> that deserves a party. Educating our design community- Can I get my wine? <laughs> and consumers on the Benjamin Moore products and colors. Diana is on the board for New Jersey CSI and is an allied member of AIA. So please join Diana now for the CEU, Why Pigments Matter. Okay. Hi, everybody. Say hi now, because I'm going to turn my, my, uh, my video off once we start the presentation. Do you need to, I can just click share screen, right? Yes. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, awesome. Okay. So thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and as we get forward, our CEU today is on why pigments matter. Let's go take myself up there. This is a one learning CEU. Um, you will be receiving, uh, once I've uploaded all of the attendees, you will be receiving an email from AEC Daily where you can download your CEU certificate. And we will then also provide the AD, IDCC and AIA numbers uh, will get recorded. Okay, so just I'll send an email to remind you to look for it. If you don't get it, you don't see it, please let me know. Okay, it is one learning unit uh, for AIA and IDCEC. And what are we going to be looking at today? Why do pigments matter? Um, this course really is just going to explore how color choices affect the appearance and performance of architectural paints. Um, we're going to discuss types of pigments used in architectural coatings and how paint is tinted and how the choice of pigments and colorants actually influence factors like hide and gloss and fade and durability. Color's been around us forever, you know, and history has shown us that color makes huge impacts um, on our emotions. Um, it has driven exploration. It has uh, provided economic activities. It, when we look at color, it touches our lives every time we turn around. And the sourcing and trading of the actual pigments was and still remains a big business. And it still dictates a large part of the cost of the paint. When we look at color today though, color today is the work of scientists. Um, colors generated in labs, mass produced to meet the aesthetic performance and economic needs of the end user, of you and I. So for this CEU today, we are going to be really focusing on pigments and colorants, but I think before we begin, we should just sort of do a quick review on the components of paint. And for any of you who have sat through any of my other presentations, we know that there are four components of paints. You have your resin or binder, which actually promotes your adhesion to, adhesion to the substrate. 
Um, the pigments, which we will be, of course, discussing today, providing color, hide, and protection to the substrate. You have additives, uh, which you know, help to improve overall performance. And then, of course, you have your solvents, which um, is either water uh, in the water-based paints. It's what basically reduces the paint's thickness. Okay. So as we move forward, we're actually going to be discussing pigments as they're used in architectural coatings. Oh, and don't forget the colorant that we add at the store. <laughs> So pigments are fine particles of insoluble colored materials. Uh, they provide color, of course, hide and protection of the substrate. There are five distinct types of pigments. As you can see here on the screen, we show you, you've got primary white, you've got color pigments, inert or extender pigments, metallic pigments, and specialty pigments. Okay. There are two broad categories for um, classifying pigments. And as you see here, you've got your primary pigments and your inert or extender pigments. Now the primary pigments consist of primary white and color pigments. And they provide, like we just said a little earlier, they are providing your color, your hide and protection. Where the inert or extender pigments, they serve two purposes in paints. Uh, they help to extend the primary white pigments and supply many characteristics like the durability or um, controlling the sheen and the gloss, helping with scrub resistance and stain resistance properties that are added um, of the paint. Primary white pigment, of course, does exactly what it says. It supplies the whiteness and um, is really the main source of opacity in the paint. Um, opacity, of course, is the ability to cover what's on the substrate, whether it be another color or just going over drywall. So one of the most common primary pigments used today, of course, is titanium dioxide. And I've talked a lot in the past about titanium dioxide or TiO2, um, as it is one of the most expensive pigments that's used in paints. Uh, but it's not just paint you find it in. And what really kind of raises the cost of this pigment is the fact that it, it is used in so many industries, whether it be in your toothpaste um, or the makeup that we use on our face, even the bright white styrofoam cup that you get at the coffee shop. You know, that's TiO2 being used to provide that whiteness. Um, so you see a lot more TiO2 when you look at your white or your lighter colors. Um, and it's used a lot because of that pure white mass tone. Um, mass tone is the dominant hue of the paint. Um, it really is providing, it's got the majority of the hiding power that you need uh, when painting over the uh, existing colors and things like that. Um, it's also got excellent tinting strength, good resistance to chemicals and UV resistance. Um, and ironically, it's actually harder than most other pigments, making it more Diane, I can't hear you. Can you guys hear me? Now I can. Did you not hear me go through any of this? No, I just heard the very end. Yes. That's the hard pigment. Just the last minute. Are you kidding? This, just the last minute was was uh, muted. I Oh, okay. I sent you a message in the chat. Oh, <laughs> and I'm talking. <laughs> not paying attention to the chat. I don't think it's even showing up. I'm getting blue things across my screen. Okay. Okay. I apologize. I don't know what caused that. No worries. You can hear me now, though. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the TiO2 being 
the most expensive, one of the most expensive pigments being used in so many different areas of today's life, whether it's in our toothpaste or our makeup, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we're going into now the inert and extender pigments. Um, now the inert and extender pigments help to extend and really maximize the primary white pigment. Um, extender pigments provide little in terms of color and opacity. Um, they do, however, improve the paint characteristics such as the viscosity or the thickness of the paint. Uh, helps in pigment dispersion, durability, washability. Again, and it's, as I said earlier, it helps to control that gloss and the sheen levels. And paint manufacturers select extender pigments based on the desired performance of the specific product they're working with. Um, common extender pigments are things like clay, silica, calcium carbonate, limestone. Now, primary white and extender pigments affect the mass tone of untinted paint. Okay. Am I muted again? You were not muted, but someone okay. doesn't have their, um, okay. someone needs to mute themselves. <laughs> Deborah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very confused. <laughs> um, so as we're talking about primary white and extender pigments, um, the primary white, both of these are going to affect the mass tone of the untinted paint. So if you walked into a paint store and you opened a gallon that has had no colorant put into it, that's your primary, that's your mass tone, okay? Um, it's, like I said, the dominant hue of the paint. So for example, TiO2 has a white mass tone. It looks white, whereas if you're looking um, at something that's got a more of a calcium carbonate base, it's more yellowish. And clay may actually come across grayer. So to compensate for these uh, mass tones, paint manufacturers will actually use different color prescriptions or color formulas to tint the same color across different product lines. You know, And why actually some colors may not even be available in certain products. So here we're gonna take a look at color pigments, okay? Color pigments are classified as either organic or inorganic. Organic pigments are derived from plants, animals, and synthetic sources. Inorganic pigments are insoluble compounds made of minerals, and they're either mined or synthesized. In general, organic pigments have smaller particle size and are brighter. Where inorganic pigments appear duller, but have better opacity and hide. Now, when it comes to exposure to sunlight and chemicals, the bright color of the organic pigments may start to diminish. Um, and this is where we look at pigments as to what's their fade factor and how do they withstand certain elements. Um, paint manufacturers will, we use a combination of organic and inorganic pigments to color, cover the color spectrum that we provide to all of you. Now, we know color pigments supply color. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, but what you need to look at is understanding the tint strength or the opacity and transparency of certain pigments. That varies between pigments. And when I talk about pigments, um, I talk in regards to paint, of course, and it refers to them more of in a powder form. So if a manufacturer were making, let's say, ready mixed colors at the factory in large batches, they would generally use powder pigments to tint paint. However, majority of color pigments are compounded into liquid dispersions, um, which we call colorants, okay? Colorants contain color pigments and other ingredients like surfactants and glycols. Colorants are added at the point of sale to an untinted paint base in accordance to whatever the manufacturer's color prescription is for that specific product. Now, manufacturers typically produce three or four bases. And if any of you have purchased paint or you're looking 
at specific colors, you can sometimes tell that lighter colors might be made in a base one because a base one is a short fill, pretty much only allowing maybe about two to four ounces of colorant in it. And then you start to go into what's called a base two, a base three, or a base four. And you can see by the cans on the screen that each base has a shorter and shorter fill to it um, because lighter colors require less colorant. You know, deeper colors, of course, you can take deep reds that could take up to 14 ounces of colorant to actually make that color. Okay. Um, I did make mention of, you know, additives in the colorants. So you have things like surfactants. Um, surfactants allow for the proper dispersion in both water-based and solvent-based products, which we're going to get into a little bit. And then you have the glycols, which are organic liquids used to prevent paints from freezing and increase the paint's open time. So as we move forward, we're going to look at the three types of colorants that you see out in the paint store these days. And you've got colorants that are basically named universal colorants, waterborne colorants, or industrial colorants. And it's interesting because when you've been in the industry this long, I've managed to live through this change. We start with universal colorants. So back 20 years ago, everybody was using universal colorants because universal colorants could be used in both your water-based and your solvent-based products. Okay. Um, hence the reason they said they called them universal. But what happens, you're actually adding an awful lot of VOCs into the paint when you're using universal colorants. And if anyone remembers when the first set of zero VOC products came out, it was being tinted with universal colorants. So you could only get, oh yeah, white, white and off white because you didn't really wanna add more than two ounces of colorant because you were actually adding VOCs to the product. And universal colorants overall, even when you got into those deeper colors, they actually started to tend to weaken the paint film. So you started to see a lot of research and development coming into play really kind of revolving around the VOC issue and going green. And lo and behold, we get waterborne colorants. And waterborne colorants are now used to tint water-based paints, such as latex, or what's also new to the market are these water uh, dispersible alkets. And waterborne colorants are typically low in VOCs, you know, much lower than a universal colorant, but still contain some small amounts of, of the glycols in them. Um, as with the universal colorants, deeper colors created by adding more colorant. So we're still going on the, you know, how much colorant can go into the gallon of paint. But I also need you to keep in mind that not all waterborne colorants are the same. So you have manufacturers that purchase their waterborne colorants from third party vendors. And you have some that actually produce their own colorants. So they may be looked at as advanced waterborne colorants and are, are formulated explicitly to work in their products. Um, selected advanced waterborne colorants are made with technology that disperses pigments in a patented blend of the ingredients. And it actually contains some of the resin that's used in the base of the paint. So really what you've seen happen with these advanced waterborne colorants is that um, these specific ones are not adding VOCs to the paint at all. And because they are made with that proprietary resin, the durability of the paint film is not compromised. And I always like to explain, if you took a look at universal colorants, if you took a can of universal colorant and a can of waterborne colorant, universal colorant, if you dump it on the floor, is not going to dry. It needs the paint to dry. Waterborne colorants will dry. So now you've got, um, you know, this chemical emulsion here that you know is drying rapidly. It's giving you um, 
more durability in the paint film. It's giving you better overall color retention, even in those deeper colors. And then we have the industrial colorants. Um, the industrial colorants are formulated to meet high performance needs. Many of you may never even touch products in your projects that require this, but products that would take industrial colorants would be high performance solvent-based epoxies. Um, these types of colorants contain resins and aromatic solvents. You know, you'll see things like toluene and xylene, um, and they also contain high levels of VOCs. Hence, you know, this is what they put on the George Washington Bridge or in car washes. So, so we understand your pigments, you understand um, colorants, and now we're just going to take a look at their impact um, in their performance and the durability of the paint film. Okay, now durability. How durable is the paint? Sometimes I like to look at people and say, you need to manage your customer's expectations because it is just paint, but resistance to damage from expected environmental conditions, you know, your everyday life. So looking at durability, how do pigments relate to this? Well, we need to look at products that have good abrasion resistance, have good washability, scuff resistance, have good UV resistance if they're going to be outside. You also need to look at things like color rub off, chalking, cracking, peeling. So these are all things that can happen and then just in your everyday daily life, but using proper pigments with better resins, we can help sort of avoid this. Okay, so let's look at some of the issues we face. Um, I know many of you, especially when the first, you know, matte finishes were introduced, color rub off. Okay, your client picks a deep red and she wants it in flat. They put flat on the wall. You go to wash it, you get red on the rag, you get white marks on the wall. You know, why is this happening? Why do colors fade? Are deeper colors less durable? you're gonna hit questions like, why can't I match a color? And we're gonna end actually with what is full spectrum color? So when we look at color rub off, and I, I'm sure you have all experienced it, we have to take a look at something called pigment volume concentration, okay, PVC. Now PVC is how much pigment is actually in the paint relative to the amount of resin. Okay, resin was our, our binder, one of those core components. Okay, it helps it pr promote the adhesion to the substrate. So when we look at this, and we look at, let's say a high gloss or semi-gloss, looking at the chart in front of you, on your left, you'll see the word high next to gloss, but underneath you will see low to high under your PVC. So when you get into the satin semi-gloss and high gloss, you're going to see that it's got a lower pigment volume concentration to give us a high gloss, where when you go to a flat, a matte, or an eggshell, it has a much higher pigment volume concentration. I think this screen actually really sort of explains it better, um, especially when we start talking to people about how the differences in the different sheen and gloss levels affect um, any of your projects. So what you're looking at here, take that black line as being your substrate. The tan gray color there is your resin. And then your blue triangles are your pigments. So when you look at flat paint, okay, you're gonna see that line come across there. And you're going to see that there's pigment actually sitting above the surface. Um, flatter paints, like I said, contain more pigment and less resin. And this results actually in a uniform non-reflective appearance uh, that actually helps when, you know, when hiding surface imperfections. 
And the protrusion of all of these little pigment particles that you're looking at through the resin layer is what causes the diffraction of light and creates that dullness. You go up, you'll notice that the semi-gloss has less and then the gloss, they're almost encapsulated, okay? So the protrusion of pigments in the flat actually makes it easier for them to burnish as you try to wash it because you're actually washing pigments away. Where when you look at a high gloss, all the pigment is pretty much underneath that surface and is very well protected. But it also then creates that harder, more durable paint film and gives us that beautiful gloss finish. And then what happens when the sunlight hits it? It actually starts to highlight any of the imperfections that might be on the wall. So it's just another way to look at, I think it's an easier way to understand pigment volume concentration. So how do we mitigate color rub off? And you know, you're looking at a pretty extreme it. Uh, blown up picture of somebody rubbing against the wall and you can see where the colors come off. Um, color can wear off for a couple of different reasons, okay? The resin can either start to deteriorate or the colorant formulation does not adequately bind the pigment to the resin, or maybe there's just too much pigment relative to the resin. What we could do, what can we do to actually mitigate it? Well, when we look at your actual paint specifications, and I, along with all of my competitors, probably talk about this all the time. When you put your specification out, be product specific, because you want to be able to specify a paint that contains a good quality resin. So if you just put in your drawings a latex eggshell, you're leaving it wide open for them to use any quality level, shall I say, um, and not maybe not giving you exactly what you wanted for that project. So other things to help mitigate it, maybe you need to select a higher gloss based on where this product is being used. Is it in a hallway where everybody's banging up against stuff? Um, one of the other things too is we don't alter the manufacturer's color prescriptions, okay? Recall from the color in Discussion earlier, certain colorants are made for specific products. Um, one of the other things is, um, I love what my retailers can tell me, you know, Mrs. Smith homeowner came in, we tinted her a gallon of paint, and let's say it was a two base and it took that full six ounces of colorant, but now she wants it just a little darker. So what happens now when you start to add in more colorant? you're actually creating an off balance um, in that gallon of paint because technically with all that color in, we should have moved bases. So there's all sorts of things that can, when there's too much color in, it weakens the paint film. And if it's over tinted, shall I say, and issues like this can occur. Why do colors fade? Um, I think most of us understand why they fade, uh, sunlight, environmental conditions, chemicals in the air. Um, they actually start to degrade the physical structure of the pigment, causing it to lose color. Um, the degree of fading, of course, is gonna vary depending upon the amount of UV exposure. Actually, it can also uh, be affected by the particular pigments that were used and the quantity and quality of the pigments in the paint. So, you know, when we're looking at fade, keep in mind, darker colors are going to show that fade more easily. To help minimize fade, looking at quality exterior products that offer good UV resistance is the ability of the paint, you know, to resist that deterioration. Um, as the uh, pigment particles are exposed, the coating of the surface, the loose pigment that easily rubs off, is also known as chalking. Um, I'm sure you've all run your hand across areas that uh, you get the white dust on your hand or a colored dust on your hand because the pigments are starting to break down. So ironically, pigments, some pigments have really good UV resistance. So higher amounts of pigments 
are actually required to protect the resin from UV radiation. So this actually can limit your color choices in exterior paints because not all pigments are UV resistant um, or equally UV absorbing, let's put it that way. So fade resistance um, is something we need to look at um, the type of pigments and colors that you're choosing to help kind of minimize where that's going to happen. But what you can say when we go back to the advanced waterborne colorants, with that new technology, we are seeing um, much better overall fade resistance and lasting color in a lot of these areas. So one of the other questions that comes up, are deep colors less durable? Well, if we go back to um, what type of product we're using, um, we can look at what colorants are they being used to be tinted. If you're working with products that are still using universal colorants, like I said, those deeper colors are taking more colorant um, and more colorant may weaken the paint film. If you go to the products now that are using these waterborne colorants, um, you're getting, again, much better paint film durability and color retention. And when you look at, uh, even from the standpoint of the base, you know, you can only put so much titanium dioxide for hide and overall hardness in a base four, which is going to take those deep colors. So again, having better colorants that are more durable will make that dark color more durable. Does that make sense? <laughs> So when we look again at deep colors and durability, um, a couple of things that you may run into, you may run into increased drying time in certain products in darker colors. Um, again, that really kind of goes back to more of the products that use universal tint colorants, um, deeper colors in flatter paints um, generally are going to show that color rub off more. So again, we go back to mitigating this with using quality products and colorants. Does a color's prescription impact durability? Well, it's more like, do all manufacturers use the same color prescription? And that's really interesting. Our color prescriptions are actually um, designed to meet certain criteria and performance requirements. So when you're looking at um, a color prescription for an exterior product, they're going to be looking to use colorants that they know are going to have the least fade resistance. Um, and even with that note there saying the adjusting the color prescription at point of sale, you risk changing the gloss level. Because what happens when we add a lot of pigment into it, it can actually make that gloss look duller, okay? So, you know, one of the um, performance requirements on color prescriptions too is, um, has to do with the undertones. So, when we look at color prescriptions, not every manufacturer can use the same color, color prescription because A, manufacturer A may buy their colorants where manufacturer B may make their colorants. They're not the same and nor are they the same tint strength. So you've all run into the problem of trying to match somebody else's color and it's really not matching it exactly. It may look correct in a store under a specific lighting, but when moved, you see a difference in the way it appears. Um, so for instance, an example, you have a manufacturer's dark brown uh, that could be formulated with or without an organic bright yellow. So the paint containing an organic yellow may fade um, 
may actually fade in the sun, but it also, the yellow won't. So there's that fade portion of it where when you look at the next screen and we look at this color, the prescriptions on what you use from your day-to-day -day, um, interior colors of matching, I'm gonna ask you when you look at this color, what color are you seeing? Okay. For example, you might be seeing, let's say blue, maybe an aquamarine blue. The undertone here is a subtle influence of just one color of pigment. So underneath the mass tone that distinguishes it from the similar colors, the undertone of the color may not be apparent until it's paired with other colors or under certain lighting, which is like when I said, when you go into the store and it matches, when he, ma when he shows it to you, it looks like it matches under that lighting, but when you get it home, it's two completely different colors. We can look at it from here. Manufacturer A may use the pigments um, synthetic ultramarine, titanium white, lamp black to create that aquamarine blue. Manufacturer B may use phthalo blue, titanium white, organic yellow, and iron oxide. Now at that point, the colors really may appear to match, but they're different undertones that may only be apparent under certain lighting conditions. So you look at the can, it looks good in the can. You apply it to the walls. And now the color shifts subtly or dramatically even due to the color temperature of the light source. So in this example, the titanium white undertone from manufacturer A and the organic yellow from manufacturer B may only become apparent once the paint is applied to the walls and other colors and light are introduced. Manufacturers A color in the morning light might appear lighter and darker in the evening light. Whereas manufacturers B color in the morning light with the yellow undertone mixing with the blue will appear a little greener or brighter. And as the sun goes down, that little bit of red pigment will warm up the aquamarine blue. So the takeaway here is that the retailers can match colors, but it's never going to be exact. But we always look at what about matching colors of other materials. And especially over the last year with everybody living on Pinterest and things of that, colors produced by light, such as images on your computer screen, well, they're created by additive color mixing. When all the colors of light are added together, the result is white light. Now, physical colors, such as dyes, inks, and paints, are created by subtractive color mixing. Mixing, <coughs> excuse me, mixing all the pigment and dye colors results in a black substance. And you cannot exactly match what you see on a screen with a physical material, um, as the colors you see are created using two completely different systems. So when you call me and tell me and ask me, Diana, can you match the color in this picture? I might tell you, maybe. <laughs> we can try, but it's never going to be an exact match. And the same goes pretty much with printed materials. Um, you know, looking at inks and dyes um, versus paints. All these processes are different. Printing processes use a set of primary colors of cyan, magenta, and yellow where paint formulations use red, yellow, and blue, um, even trying to match textiles, never mind texture, also plays um, a part in trying to match these colors. And then you also have full spectrum colors. And I love these colors because I like to say they dance in the light. But what are full spectrum colors? Well. Black and gray colorants are used in color prescriptions as toners. So there's many a formula you could look at, like a linen white, maybe orange, yellow, and black. So it's being, or orange, yellow, and gray rather. And it's sort of being balanced and toned with that gray. Um, they bring down the chroma or brightness of the color. So black and gray are not found in the visible light spectrum and therefore absorb all the frequencies of light. 
So artificial light sources emit varying frequencies of light. For example, the incandescent bulb, it emits lower frequency light waves uh, resulting, I'm sorry, warmer light waves resulting in that yellowish co color where you get the fluorescent bulbs, uh, which give you those cooler, bluer colors. So color prescriptions that contain black or gray are more stable under diverse natural and artificial light sources because they absorb all light frequencies. Now full color, ah, full spectrum color prescriptions, they do not complain, uh, contain black and gray. Um, they use a theory of complementary colors. Complementary colors, <clears throat> opposites on the color wheel when mixed together, you know, give you a gray, a brown with different undertones. So if you take a small amount of blue, it will tone down the orange and a bit of green will tone down red. So the resulting color is called full spectrum color because it contains a bit of pigment from every part of the spectrum, which is why I like to say it dances in the light. There's all your complementary colors. So looking at this picture for full spectrum, you've got a typical navy blue generally contains, when you're looking at a navy, a blue, a yellow oxide, and a black. The artificial light and sun in the space will react to the blue and yellow oxide, but not the black. So full color spectrum, full spectrum colors are not toned with black or gray. A full spectrum navy may contain the blue, yellow oxide, red, red oxide, magenta, and green. The yellow oxide tones the magenta and the red tones the green. So using diverse pigments results in a color that reacts to a broad spectrum of light frequencies. I actually like when you look at full spectrum, how rich those colors actually appear. They seem so much more dimensional and more complex. Um, that's why I say, I like to say they dance in the light. Um, and this is particularly apparent even in with the neutral colors that contain blacks and grays, um, which appear duller while, while a full spectrum neutral can appear more lively and nuanced. So as we reach the end of our presentation, what can you take away? Well, paints are carefully formulated to balance performance, ease of application and cost. Um, designers should bear in mind that pigments impact more than color and significantly influence the hide, gloss and durability of a tinted paint. Um, pigments have varying performance characteristics, such as their tint straight, their hide, and UV absorption or resistance. And paints are primarily tinted at the point of sale using universal, waterborne, or solvent colorants. So we learn that not all waterborne colorants are the same, and there are advantages to using certain advanced waterborne colorants um, that are specific to manufacturers' product lines where there's no additional VOCs during tinting. Deeper colors do not dilute the paint film, so durability is not compromised. And these select advanced waterborne colorants are formulated to resist fade and color rub off. So you can see research and development within pigments and colorants have come a long way. And you can find out more information about the types of colorants used to tint paint products on any manufacturer's website or even their technical data sheets. So at this point, I just wanna say thank you. Um, did we have any questions regarding the presentation? Well, that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no questions, we you covered it all. Yeah, when we refer to colorants, um, like I said, research and development, if you go back to God, 2005, when they started to really um, make stricter EPA regulations uh, regarding VOCs, you saw all manufacturers come across with new products, new, uh, really more environmentally friendly, sustainable products. And part of that came at Benjamin Moore with our Gen X colorant technology, which is used pretty much across the board in 
many, many, many of the products you all are using on your day-to-day -day jobs. So it is wonderful. And then uh, basically for any of you that might be um, interested or may not be aware of the full spectrum color line, our Aura color stories, which can only be made in Aura um, because of all of the colorant that's used in it for premium performance. And then basically if you're missing or need to be updated, please contact me. You will be receiving an email from me um, once I get the list of all attendees. Um, letting you know that you've been uploaded and to expect that AEC daily email where you can download your certificates. So I wanna thank you so much for your time. And it's almost five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> you need to put your camera on, Diana. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Start video, there we go. Yeah, see? It's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> Most everybody knows me. They'll get a kick out of that one. But great. Thank so you. Thank you. Diana, can you send me? I see you were recording it. Would you mind sending it to me if you can or a link or something to it? I, I'm, I'm not sure who I'm talking to. It's Holly. I'm sorry. It's Holly. Oh, hi, honey. <laughs> what is what did you need a link to? The your recording of this presentation because I missed the first, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. It wasn't yeah, I couldn't hear the sound and I had to switch out and try a different um okay. I, it will I, be up on the website. I, oh, will it? Okay. Yeah, it'll be yeah. up on the website and then a link to our YouTube channel, Holly. Okay. And it's also on uh I believe it's also on AEC Daily. Not me giving it, but <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to get I don't know what that is but that's, that's okay. okay it'll be up within two days okay all right great it's good to see you Diana hi Terry hi, <laughs> too. hey Holly I'm not putting my video on <laughs> oh and all right. thank it's thank you time. Diana thanks thank um, you was a everybody great have a great night okay you yeah too. thank you and I just want to before everyone leaves um just want to remind everyone that we have a virtual book club next week on May 25th at 12 p.m. with Barbara Hewlett. She's an FASID, author of Healing Spaces, um, an expert on evidence-based design research. It's going to be great. Um, if you can't make it, it will be recorded as well, but please try to see it in person. And then also our in-person DEA award ceremony will be in person this year on June 23rd. It was just decided um, at the Hack in Hackensack at the Stony Hill Inn. So um, invites will be going out any day now. So please check your inboxes and, um, and uh, join us. It'll be a great first event to, to celebrate being out outdoors, <laughs> but indoors or together, I should say. All right. So thank you, everyone. Terry, Thanks again, Diana. Terry? Yes. Um, Myerson, he has his hands up. Oh, okay. Um, do you want to, Elena? Uh, I don't see a hand. He has his hand raised. He doesn't have a question in the... Um... Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you have a question? I think no. he has to unmute himself. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like when he raises their hand, they, they want to ask something. So, okay. Okay. Right, so well, you can always email Diana as well if you, if you still have a question. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All so right. Much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.